<laughs> Cords everywhere. Um, I'm going to just really quickly go over not what I do, but who I am. So I'm going to quickly just tell you a story, and then we will get to the more important person who is sitting next to me, uh, Robbie Damlin. Let me first um, just tell you a very short story about when I was a child. Um, I was going to eighth grade um, to a brand new school. Uh, I had moved a lot. My mother raised me on her own. Uh, we did a lot of moving. She was a bit of a gypsy. Uh, she liked to try new places and um, do new things. Uh, the forms that they tell you to fill out at the school always had, what race are you? And because I came from a mixed race background, I always had trouble with that part of the form. And so my mother would tell me, there's a very simple answer, don't check anything, just write, because there was always a little line there that, sa that said, you know, specify if you didn't check anything. Um, and so she would tell me what to do. So I went to class, and all my forms were all messed up because I would never fill it out, it just didn't bother. And I had a teacher that sat down and looked at me and said, so what are you in front of the entire class? Because I hadn't filled out the forms properly. So I looked up at him, and I said what my mother had always told me. I said, oh, I am a human being, that's it. With that, I want to say to you that as a human being, the people that you're going to meet and hear from today are some of the most amazing human beings that you will ever get to know. And I've learned about some folks just recently and others I've been watching for a very long time, like Barka Dutt when I lived in India. Um, and so I, I want you to understand um, what a wonderful opportunity this is and a great, great honor it is for me to be able to be here with you other human beings who happen to be female and male, um, thank you for having me and thank you for coming out for this. It's really important that we all talk amongst ourselves. So with that, I want to introduce you to an extremely wonderful, caring, compassionate, fighting, <laughs> we've already started on each other, woman who has gone through perhaps the most, not perhaps, the most horrible thing that a parent can ever go through when she lost her son to a Palestinian sniper. Robbie Damlin has been through hell, but instead of taking revenge as what is a natural thing for a lot of human beings to do, she decided instead to use her grief, to use her power as a human being, to try and change things. And so we're going to talk just to her about how she went about doing that. And first I want to ask you the horrible thing that journalists always ask first, Tell me about the worst day of your life. Um, well, actually, it's a very strange story because I had a premonition in a way. Um, David had called me the day before and said he was in a ridiculous place, and he actually never told me what he was doing. He was in the reserves. He was a student at Tel Aviv University, and he was studying for his master's in the philosophy of education and it was part of the peace movement. And you see, you don't really know who the person is behind the gun. People think they do, but when David was called to go to the reserves, he came to talk to me. And he said, look, I don't know what to do. If I don't go, what happens to my students? Tell he was me teaching why he philosophy. was struggling. Tell me why he was struggling Because with he this. didn't want to serve in the occupied territories. Because, and then he said, and if I don't go, what happens to my soldiers? He was the officer. And if I do go, I will treat people with dignity and so will all my soldiers. And really, um, I was filled with a sense of dread. And on the morning um, that he was killed, I actually got up terribly early in the morning. I cleaned my house, which is unusual for me. <laughs> and um, I dashed off to work as soon as I could. And, and then the soldiers came to tell me. And apparently one of the first things that I said is, you may not kill anybody in the name of my child. So there was a seed somewhere planted. And I knew that I wanted to do something. I didn't know what. And I met this man who invited me to go to a, a, a seminar in East Jerusalem for other bereaved parents, Palestinian and Israeli. And I wasn't all that keen to go because I thought I have enough, you know, I don't need all this other pain as well. But I went and, you know, I suddenly recognized, um, I looked into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and I saw that we shared the same pain. 
and that that pain could be such an extraordinary weapon for us if we could stand on stage together and talk in the same voice, then surely that would be an example to other people. It was um, such an earth-shattering experience for me, really, to know that, that I could do something and that I had the power all my life, even in South Africa, where I come from, as you obviously have realized by now, um, I, I was in the anti-apartheid movement, but it was like 30% of my life was dedicated to causes. And now, um, it's my life. It's just, it's not work, it's a mission. And um, I've experienced the most extraordinary um, journey of, of looking at honesty. You know, um, till I got to writing that letter, actually I'd, I'd walked around and been a big deal and gone and spoken all over the world and thought I was really something special. <laughs> And then I came back to Israel and there was a knock on my door and it was the soldiers again. And they came to tell me that they caught the man who killed David. And that was when it really became difficult because you know, you can talk about peace and reconciliation and, but you've got to mean it. Can I ask you something? When you got that first knock on your door, because generally they'll come to your door, um, and to be clear, for those who aren't familiar with the way that um, Israeli society works, you are required to go through a certain number of years um, in the armed forces, like it or not. I mean, whether you're for it, against it, you are required to do that. But when you got that knock on the door, that initial knock, how did the first thing that came out of your mouth, it was such the opposite of what most people would be thinking, which is revenge, anger, sadness, everything else but what you said. I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, um, it's a pain that nobody can describe. You know, I'm a fixer. And I thought I could fix, you can't fix this. But you choose a path. And, and I knew that I wanted to do something to prevent other families from experiencing this pain. And once um, they caught the man who killed David, I suddenly recognized that if I wasn't willing to have some kind of completion with this man, I couldn't do this work, because it would be out of, out of integrity completely. And so that's not easy. You know, I went back to South Africa and looked at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to try and learn something for us, for what we could do. And um, I met the most extraordinary woman whose daughter had been killed by APLA, which was the African National Congress um, military wing. And she'd gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and she said, I forgive you to the men who'd killed her children. And I wanted to know what she meant by forgive. What do you mean? You know, I wish you'd all go home and think about what forgiving means for you personally. I asked rabbis and imams and the chief and the archbishop of Canterbury and you name it, and nobody could come up with anything that was so meaningful as she did. Because she said to me, um, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. And I met the man who'd actually sent um, these young guys to kill her daughter. And he said, by her forgiving me, she has released me from the prison of my inhumanity. You see, there are amazing people that you meet along the way. And I really honestly believe that people can change. Because I saw this in South Africa, I've seen it in Ireland, I've seen it all over the world. Because if I didn't believe that, then why would I do this work? So then I came back, you know, full, we made a film about South Africa and about my own journey with this man. And I decided it's time now. How long was it from the time your son, who was 28, so a young guy, just sort of starting out his life, from the time he was killed to the time that you ended up talking with the person who killed him? No, we have not met. Never met? No, I, I now have permission except if you recognize that there's been an election in Israel and I'm not sure what's going to happen we'll now. We'll get to that. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you the difficult questions. Um, <laughs> it's, but did, uh, you have any, did you have any ability? You knew who it was. Yes, you well, were that's told when it became it difficult. Because right. yeah. when there's a face, right. 
then you have to deal with it. Yeah. You know, when um, there was the young soldier who was captured and kidnapped, Gilad Shalit, and so uh, I, we'd been working with the family all the time and saying, release the prisoners. I've got a big mouth, so I used to go to the television and say all of this. And then on the night that they announced that they were releasing all these thousand prisoners thousand, for him, right? yeah, yes. um, they said that they were releasing the man who killed David as well. It was a mistake, but I didn't know that for a whole weekend. And what did and you think And that's again, that you see, here, here it comes. This whole work is not like just a path of ease. There are all these stumbling blocks that come along the road to see if you mean what you say. I'm not a saint, you know, but I, it's just so important for me to complete this. It's not that I'm a victim. I was so happy to hear that you were talking about not being a victim. You know, once I wrote that letter that you read, there was like the sense of giving up being a victim and, and being free. Because when you're a victim, you're just the victim of the man who killed your son. But now I'm free. Tell me about the letter and tell, tell everyone here about the letter. Well, the letter is what I was reading partly over there. And then, um, of course, two Palestinians from our group. We are 600 families, um, Palestinian and Israeli, who all lost an immediate ma a family member to the conflict. And really what we believe is that um, in any future peace agreement, I know it sounds crazy after today's results, <laughs> but in any future peace agreement, and by the way, Now's the time to work harder, and now's the time for you to support the peace movement. We cannot, we cannot give up. You know, I got so many miserable um, mails, and, and, and I, it's difficult. Sometimes like taking water out of the sea with a teaspoon, you know. But it is so important. This voice is so important. This week, the whole week, we've been working at the parents' circle, we took um, a tombstone and we built a room around the tombstone for the future victims of the conflict because the conflict became the elephant in the room. Nobody was talking about it in the elections, and that's a big mistake because when you're dishonest, you can't possibly ever win anything in the long run. But to be fair, people feel like it's an impossible thing to deal with. It's been going on for so long that there's sort of this sense on both sides that we keep talking and talking and talking, but we don't see any real progress. So it's one of those things people don't want to delve into because they feel like it's just not going to happen, right? Well, I can tell you that when I came to live in, in Israel in 1967, after all the years in the anti-apartheid movement, that um, if you would have told me then that blacks and whites would sit together and find a way not to kill each other, I would have said you were mad. But the fact is, it worked. We cannot not, we cannot, I look at my grandchildren's eyes and I think to myself, do they have to also go to the army? Is that what's waiting for them? Is that the destiny to die? Do we share graves? Is that the destiny of Israel and Palestine? I don't think so. What did the grave say? Um, it says, we don't want you here. And that was a theme that we created during the war. Um, we made a clip that became viral all over the world, which said, we don't want you here. And it's in meaning Hebrew and in Arabic. In Hebrew, Arabic, meaning English. we don't want any more members in the parents' circle. And um, so what I was saying is that in any future peace agreement, the, the vision of this organization is that there has to be a reconciliation process as an integral part of any future peace agreement. Otherwise, another ceasefire till the next time. Since you brought it up, <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> there was an election just yesterday, um, and it looks as though Prime Minister Netanyahu will be the Prime Minister again before becoming Prime Minister. In the, in the day or two before he has, uh, well, may become Prime Minister, they're still trying to work out the government. Wow. Um, yes. Um, but in the days before, something was said that hasn't been said by him before in a public setting, and that was, there will not be a Palestinian state on my watch. Your thoughts? Well, that's the first time he's ever been honest, <laughs> if you think about it. And, you know, the Palestinians have been saying this all along, that he doesn't mean it. He didn't mean it. 
it was to placate the Americans and the Europeans. And so maybe now that the cat is out of the bag, you know, things have to get terrible to get better. And, and um, I'm so sad because there was such a sense of hope. I was at the demonstration last week and 80,000 people came, but we live in a bubble because I live in Tel Aviv and people from Haifa and Tel Aviv came. And when you look at the outskirts, you know, but I just was thinking as we were sitting here about women, you know, um, during the war, um, my house is in Tel Aviv, but a lot of rockets came over into Tel Aviv. So I went down to the shelter. We don't have a remarkable shelter in my building, I must say. If somebody <laughs> did this, probably would be the end of us, but it was an opportunity to meet the neighbors and their dogs. And <laughs> so I went down, and, and there was a woman standing there with a baby, with a little ball in its hands. And I said, um, I thought to myself, wow, you're so lucky. Think how insane this is. I'm in a shelter, the rocket's outside, and I think I'm lucky. Why? Because the women in Gaza didn't have anywhere to run. The women in Gaza were stuck. If they left their homes, they might have been killed by the Hamas. If they ran to a shelter in UNRWA, they might have got shot there because rockets were being shot from there. <coughs> and so, you know, I think to myself, and then I hear a woman from Sterot, which is on the border of Gaza, and she says she's got 15 seconds to get to the shelter, but she's got three kids and one is in a wheelchair. So <coughs> who should she take to the shelter? And who are the victims of war? Women. Women and children. children. And nobody asks us, should we go to war? Nobody asks us, you know, should we cease fire? And nobody asks us to come to the table, and that's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, and that's why the women in my group are becoming stronger and stronger, because we have to stop this. We have to stop the killing. I want to play a very short clip um, of some of the work that your group has done, and it's something that um, just it should be seen. It's short, so we're going to go ahead and roll it now. אנחנו לא רוצים אתכם פה. אנחנו לא רוצים אתכם פה. לא נוריד אתכם פה. לא רוצים אתכם פה. לא נוריד אתכם פה. לא נוריד אתכם פה. אנחנו לא רוצים אתכם פה. לא נוריד אתכם פה. לא נוריד אתכם פה. עופו מפה. אנחנו לא רוצים אתכם פה. אנחנו לא רוצים אתכם פה. While you're getting quite a reception here and, and a lot of people who are hearing what you're saying, and I can tell you from having lived there myself, and I've lived in Jerusalem and been in Gaza and been in the West Bank and been in the other Palestinian territories, and when you, people always come up to me and they say, what side are you on? What side are you on? I hear that question over and over and over again. So, what side are you on? Well, it's a competition, you know. Um, for, for say, it's a competition of who's suffering most and a, con a competition of who's the victim. And sometimes I think the Palestinians are the victim of the victim. But I would ask, if there's nothing else you take away with you tonight, just don't be pro-Palestinian, don't be pro-Israel. Please be part of the solution and not the problem. Because... <laughs> If you are pro either side, what you are doing is importing our conflict into your country and creating hatred between Jews and Muslims. That's not, that's not what you want. Can I ask you what, your, what the reaction was when you came into the room with Palestinians uh, and Jews, Israelis, when you came into that room of people who had suffered just like you, what was the reception that you got? You know, there's an innate trust because you share the same pain. <coughs> So um, there's a sense of love. It doesn't mean that you all agree with each other's national um, narrative. And that's why we run a lot of workshops of narratives to create empathy. Because when you understand the way the other sees their history, 
that's when there can be change, and that's when you can start to communicate. When you see the humanity in the other, that's when there can be change. So we do, that's a lot of the work that we do. And I want to lastly ask you <coughs> what the reception to the projects that you've been involved with is now, because the reception that I get when I talk about do you think there's going to be a peace process, most people, whereas maybe 15, 20 years ago was different, scoff at the idea. While they say they want it, they simply do not believe it's going to happen. Well, I can't afford to give up hope. You know, I, it's easy for somebody who doesn't live there to become um, judgmental, you know, or not want to compromise. Um, from both sides, I, I met um, Palestinians who live here, and I said, you have to compromise. Your children are not standing at checkpoints. And the same thing for the Jewish population who live here. I'm going to be back here in Los Angeles on the 27th with a Palestinian partner, and we're going to talk in many venues. And there are a lot of people who don't agree with us, but I embrace them because you must talk to everybody. If you exclude people, they become more radical. So let's open to talk. We don't have to agree. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Damlin, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.